Thank you, Dr. Gavin. I, I loved your pictures, but I didn't see much from CSI Las Vegas. Maybe, maybe because everybody here has seen that before, right? Right, and that's, that's actually something I meant to say before is uh, this, what we do is the real CSI. Uh, what you see on TV is not the real CSI. We, uh, Dr. Gavin doesn't do an autopsy and determine the cause and manner of death in 40 minutes on TV, never. Yeah, so, and none of us do our work in 40 minutes and, and finish a case, it's not possible. So our next speaker is my friend and colleague, Jose Amaral. Uh, Dr. Amaral is professor of chemistry and biochemistry and director of the International Forensic Research Institute at, at Florida International University in Miami. The interests of his research group in, include fundamental analytical chemistry and the development of analytical chemistry tools for use in forensic science, including materials analysis, trace detection, and the analysis of drugs and explosives. Professor Amaral was a practicing forensic scientist at the Miami-Dade Police Department Crime Laboratory for 12 years, where he testified in over 100 criminal cases in state and federal courts. He has authored one book and 120 peer-reviewed scientific publications in the field of analytical and forensic chemistry, and has presented 600 papers and workshops in the US, Europe, Central and South America, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Africa. Professor Amaral is a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, was the founding chairman of a, a very uh, important group uh, known as the Forensic Science Edu Education Programs Accreditation Commission of the AFS, we refer to it as FEPAC, is the past chair of the FBI-sponsored scientific working group on materials, GLASS subgroup, and is the co-editor-in-chief of a new journal, Forensic Chemistry, to be published by Elsevier in 2016. In 2015, he was appointed to serve on the Forensic Science Standards Board of Organizations of Scientific Area Committees, which is also a big deal. So, Jose? Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, thank you to the Las Vegas Natural History Museum for organizing this event and for the AFS, of course. Um, as Dr. Goldberger says, I'm a chemist and uh, I teach chemistry now at Florida International University in Miami. And um, I'm going to talk about chemistry as a, th as a central science. Uh, a lot of, often uh, students come to me and they say, you know, what should I study? I want to be a forensic scientist. Well, there's a lot of options, but you should study a natural science. Uh, how many people in the audience uh, would like to eventually become a forensic scientist? Raise your hand. So we have a few. So I'm going to try to argue that uh, you should study chemistry, which is one of the central sciences. And, uh, Chemistry connects a lot of the other sciences. As Bruce said, I was a practicing forensic scientist at uh, Miami-Dade Police Department for 12 years prior to joining the faculty at FIU. And while I was there, I had the occasion to work on some cases. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I'll start off with, with this case, which is a hit and run fatality. And we've had uh, people talk about, and I've actually tried to cross the street here in Las Vegas uh, recently. Uh, <laughs> And um, this happens all too often in Dade County. Dade County is a county of about two and a half million people. We have 44 fatalities of hit and run accidents. 20, 22 of them are pedestrians every year, which is, which is way too many. And this is one example. This happened in 2004 in Miami Beach. And there was a lady who was, um, just uh, finished her uh, grocery shopping and she was crossing the street and she gets hit by a car. She gets hit by a car so hard that she dies right at the scene. There is a witness that uh, sees the vehicle and when they call police, he tells them that it was a black BMW that hit her and that you know, went in that direction. So the police look around and about three blocks away, they see a parked black BMW with damage to the windshield. Um, so that's what we call a clue. Now, her DNA is going to be on the windshield, and if you look closely, you know, there are, there's blood on the car. So DNA in this case wasn't particularly useful because we know this is the car that hit her, that her groceries are inside the car. But take a look at the seat here. If you're seated here or in the driver's seat, what's going to be, what are you going to be sprayed with? 
glass, hundreds of shards, thousands of shards of glass will get on your person. So they identify the owner of this vehicle and they go to his house. He answers the door and they, they tell him his car has been in an accident. He goes, well, I don't know anything about that. Somebody must have stolen it last night and went off driving with it. So eventually the police uh, do some investigation to get a, a search warrant. They get probable cause for search warrant. They search his house and in his hamper they find some clothing with hundreds of shards of glass. In his sink they find shards of glass. And so this is the evidence that would associate him with being in the vehicle at the time of the accident. If there were a way that we could analyze the glass that's on his clothing and then associate it to that windshield. And lucky for us, there is a way. We can do chemical analysis on this glass. We can measure refractive index and be able to make that association. I did the analysis while I was at the uh, FIU in the chemistry department. We have developed some tests to do that. And I was ready to testify. We, we, heard, we're, we held some fry hearings. Uh, so this took on a couple of years. The uh, defense attorney was very good. He's now a judge. Um, but eventually, the day before trial, the defendant pled guilty and he got 12 years in jail. So we assist, uh, I work at the International Forensic Research Institute, which is, um, we conduct research, but we also run academic programs in forensic science. We have a Master of Science in Forensic Science, which is accredited by FEPAC. We have an undergraduate program um, for uh, young people who want to uh, study forensic science in either chemistry or biology. And we have a PhD program uh, with 35 students uh, studying, doing, conducting research in forensic chemistry. And um, I'm going to uh, argue that chemistry, the central science, is one of the natural sciences and it's a good way to connect the biological sciences um, in forensic science. So forensic science is a uh, applied science. It's kind of like uh, environmental science, engineering, and it makes use of the natural sciences. And the most interesting work going on today, I would argue, is, is in here, at the interface between the, uh, chemistry and, and biology. So biochemistry, molecular biology, these, the, the biggest advancements are going on in this, in this space. And one could argue that the father of forensic chemistry is this Catalan, Matteo Orfila, who was born in, in the island of Menorca, one of the Balearic Islands off the coast of Spain, belongs to Spain. He didn't invent the Marsh test, which is used to detect arsenic in toxicological fluids, blood, for example. But he really perfected the execution of that test. He studied chemistry in uh, Valencia. He studied medicine in Valencia went on to become a professor of medicine at the University of Paris, where there were lots of cases uh, involving arsenic poisoning. Uh, in this time period, people were dying of arsenic poisoning, but there wasn't a very good test until the Marsh test came around to detect arsenic in, in, arsenic in blood. People would die, and they would say, oh, they died of cholera because the symptoms were very similar to arsenic poisoning. So there was a, an example of uh, Lady Lafarge who had two husbands die of cholera. And uh, they conducted the Marsh test and it was, in, it, was, um, it was negative. So they hired, they still wanted to try her, so they hired um, Professor Orfila to come to court and, and he did right in the courtroom a live test and it came back positive. So even though he was hired by the defense, he was, he had integrity, he was objective, and uh, he said, yes, yeah, sure enough, there's arsenic. So she was not able to have any more husbands and no other uh, <laughs> die of. Now, around that time, there was a famous author, you may know, Arthur Conan Doyle, who came up with this fictional character, Sherlock Holmes. And if you go to London, uh, there's a statue of the fictional character and you can take a picture under the statue. He had the ability, uh, Doyle did, to uh, predict what was going to happen in forensic science. He came up with these tests way before uh, they were even uh, reported and in use. So uh, he was way ahead of his time. 
Edmond Lacard was a real-life uh, forensic scientist who convinced the Lyon police in France to allow him to use attic space in the police department to set up a laboratory. So they gave him two assistants, some space, and he started doing forensic science. So that was the first crime lab in the world in 1910. Uh, the LAPD established the laboratory in 1924, the FBI in, in 1932. Today, in the United States, there are about 400 forensic laboratories of all sizes. The biggest one is the FBI laboratory with more than 600 scientists. These laboratories are associated with police departments, law enforcement agencies, but also with medical examiner's office, like toxicology's, uh, Dr. Garvin's uh, office has a laboratory. And some are affiliated with universities. If you go to the University of Rhode Island, they host the forensic lab for the state right on campus. And here's a picture of the plaque of the building that still stands in Lyon where the laboratory, the first crime lab, uh, was ever housed. Some developments, um, Watson and Crick and Wilkins reported the structure of DNA and for that they got the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1962. But somebody was left out. Anybody know who? Come on, speak up, I can't hear. Rosalind Franklin was left out. And she wasn't left out so much on purpose, but she passed away, sadly, four years before the Nobel Prize was given. And the Nobel Committee doesn't award posthumously uh, Nobel Prizes. And that's her. She was a chemist, a physical chemist. Yeah, her PhD was in physical chemistry. And she used X-ray crystallography to determine the crystal structure that allowed Watson and Crick and Wilkins um, to describe the structure. Now, I mentioned this molecule because it's very important. We all have it in us. And uh, this was a big advance, the description of this molecule, not only for the future of forensic science, but uh, for medicine, molecular biology. And a gentleman by the name of Sir Alec Jeffries in 1985 had this eureka moment that he was doing some work in the lab and he said, you know what, if I could cut up DNA into little fragments and I can compare the fragments, I can see differences amongst individuals. And so he developed RFLP, a technique uh, to be able to do just that, Fing and he called it DNA fingerprinting. And uh, he was knighted for this effort. He was a biochemist who became a geneticist, but his undergraduate was in biochemistry. Another chemist, Carrie Mullis, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1993 for another eureka moment, and that is the polymerase chain reaction. He was driving along the Pacific Highway in California with his girlfriend in the car, and he thought, he was working at the Cetus Corporation at the time, and he thought, you know what, if I can bracket these DNA fragments, I can multiply them and get a copy. That's exactly what PCR does, and because of that, we can take the nuclear material from a single cell and multiply it thousands of times and amplify it so that we can detect now somebody's DNA from a cell that's left by licking the back of a stamp. Before, we needed a half a drop of blood to do the test. Now we can do it with one cell, routinely. And that's because Carrie Mullis had this uh, great idea. He's kind of an interesting person, by the way. This is a chemistry lab. It's not a forensic lab. It's a chemistry lab in Mexico, our neighbors down south. And I was asked to go down there and do some training in analytical chemistry. And it looks kind of like this. So this is a typical chemistry lab. You see these volumetric flasks. They're filled with liquids. And what they're doing in this lab is they're analyzing uh, uh, silver. This is the biggest silver mining company in the world. And so they have an army of chemists uh, doing these digestions all day long, 24-7, just to determine the concentration of silver in the ore and in the bullion that they're making. So that's one example of a chemistry lab. Here's another example of a chemistry lab. This is the Curiosity that was sent to Mars in 2012. And it was the first instrument. Um, so this, this Curiosity is a rover. It's a vehicle that has a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy instrument on it. 
This laser spectroscopy instrument shines a laser on whatever you want to analyze, a rock, produces a plasma, and if you look at that plasma with a telescope, you can determine what the composition of that rock is. So this is the actual rock in Mars called the Jake Matichevic rock, and this is the first rock that was ever analyzed on Mars. And you can see it's been cleaned with the laser, so you, if, you, uh, if you hit it with the laser softly, you remove all the dust. Everything on Mars has dust on it. Then you could use a high power and go into the rock and determine the bulk composition of the rock. So you get something that looks like this is the actual spectra. Uh, you can see that uh, rocks on Mars have iron, magnesium, silicon, aluminum. And the intensity of these peaks will tell you how much. So you can see the relative concentration. That's called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. It uses a laser, a uh, very, very small diameter laser, uh, 60 to 200 microns. We could do surface analysis. We could do bulk analysis. We use the plasma in order to excite uh, the outer shell electrons. When they come back down to the ground state, they emit light, they emit photons. And those photons are what we observe. So here's the laser. This is a piece of glass. In my laboratory, we do laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy to analyze glass. And we create this plasma. If we look at this plasma, we can determine the composition. It has many advantages. It's inexpensive, it's fast you could detect almost the entire periodic table of the elements um, for the composition. Um, and it's amenable to be used in the forensic laboratory. So we set out to explore about 10 years ago developing methodology to use laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy for analysis of glass. The intensity of these peaks tells us how much strontium there is. So if we take 21 different windows we can differentiate most of them just by looking at the strontium concentration. But of course, we have more information than that in the Lib spectrum. We can look at other elements. By the time we look at all the elements that we, what we want, we can differentiate all these windows by their uh, atomic emission spectra. So if you work in my laboratory, you do things like this. I ask my students at URI to go out to a junkyard, collect glass samples from windshields, and bring them back and analyze them and tell me if she can differentiate them all. And she does that, and she lists all of these elements that she analyzes. My favorite one is the most discriminating. It could discriminate 91% of all the glasses. But when you add up all the other elements that she's interested in, we can discriminate all the glasses except for eight. So I said, Sayuri, what are those eight glasses that you can't discriminate? Well, they all come from the same car, either the outside window the inside window of the same vehicle, a side window from the same vehicle as the back window. This suggests they were made in the same plant around the same time. Very powerful evidence. We've used glass analysis. We've used LIBS for glass analysis in many other cases. I'll, I'll give you one more example. This was a um, Maryland attempted bank robbery. One of my friends uh, who works in a forensic lab in, in Maryland had heard about our uh, work with laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy and laser ablation, ICPMS, and said, Jose, I have these uh, samples I'd like to send down to you to see if you can analyze them and uh, tell me what you find. I said, sure, you know, go ahead. And we, we're always open to these kind of collaborations. And here's what happened. There is a sign here at the entrance of this bank that says, please remove any facial coverings like hats or sunglasses so they, take, they can take your picture. There's a camera uh, here. They want to take your picture when you walk into the bank. There's a guy that walks in with a full ski mask covering his face, and he also has a gun. So if he has a gun, this metal detector detects the gun, sets off the alarm. The alarm also um, locks this door. So the people see this guy with a gun and a ski mask. They all freak out. They press the button that calls the police. That button locks this door. So what do you do if you're locked inside a vestibule of a bank? Well, you try to shoot your way out. And that's what he did. He, there's a bullet hole here. So now we have a bullet that's lodged itself in the bumper of a car. So the people in the bank said, this guy's crazy. Let's let him out. So um, they let him out. He gets into a van. And the van leaves. 
The police are notified, of course, and sometime later they find a van with two people in it. They find a, a ski mask, they find a gun, but they need to charge somebody with the actually going into the bank. And they search their clothing, and you can't see it very well in this picture, but inside one of the shoes of one of the people, there was a very small fragment of glass, less than one centimeter by one centimeter. But this is enough to be able to do the chemical analysis and compare this piece of glass to the window of the bank. And we did just that. We determined uh, the composition of the uh, elements, the concentration of the elements. I wrote a report and I sent it to my friend and I forgot about it. And then some months later, he says, Jose, thank you very much for your help. Um, that, remember that guy that, that was uh, charged with the attempted bank robbery? He pled guilty and he got 10 years. And what I found interesting is the title of the, of the story, CSI-style evidence nails man who shot his way out of a Crofton bank. Sometime later, I got a call from a reporter from Wired Science Magazine wanting to do a story on Libs because of the curiosity was up there. And so I said, sure, I'll talk about the forensic applications of Libs. And so he wrote the story, and it's a very nice story. And the title of the story is New Lasers Fight Crime Martians. <laughs> now, we are still working on developing methodology for doing elemental analysis. And uh, in forensic science, we have this binary decision. We say match, no match. And we do it for fingerprints. We do it for DNA. And we know what fingerprint evidence means. No, there's no two people alive today or maybe even that have ever lived to have the same fingerprints, not even identical twins, okay? So we, we have the hypothesis that we have tested. How do we test the hypothesis that no two people that ever lived? That's, that's difficult to test. But we, we have about 200 million fingerprints on a database that we test, and we haven't found two fingerprints that are the same from different people. So we can assume that no two people have the same fingerprint. Nobody has the same DNA except for identical twins. Uh, we don't testify to unique, but we testify to a probability given the number of uh, alleles that we measure uh, uh, in the profile. We don't have such a thing for elemental analysis. We know it's very strong evidence uh, because of all the testing we've done with glass from many different sources, and not just in my lab, but the FBI laboratory, the BKA laboratory, many, many different laboratories come up with the same conclusion. So it's very strong evidence. So we're still working on how to interpret this, and uh, one of the things that my students are talking about at this meeting on uh, Tuesday night, they're giving some poster presentations about the use of this likelihood ratio so that we can better express to the jury, uh, the people making the decision, uh, what we feel about this evidence. What is the significance of this evidence? So we start with an elimination with no way, no how that glass came from that window. Or an identification, absolute certainty. Well, we're not going to say either of those two things, but we're somewhere in between. We believe that we are somewhere here. Now we just have to demonstrate that scientifically. We believe that glass evidence is highly likely with a likelihood ratio between 1,000 and 10,000. Now where does DNA and fingerprint evidence sit? It sits over here. Very, very powerful. Uh, one in a billion is not unusual uh, when we're testifying about DNA evidence. You know you've arrived as an analytical technique when you make it to the cover of analytical chemistry. And you know you've arrived as a forensic technique when you make it on CSI Las Vegas. <laughs> and I was called by the producers of um, CSI um, because um, they heard about this technique. And there is a laser ablation unit here uh, that they used on the show. I talked to them for about four hours over the course of two or three days and they didn't listen to a word I said in the end. Uh, but they made a very nice animation, uh, which I use for teaching. Uh, so uh, in this story here, there is no ICPMS. There was, there's another instrument that's supposed to be connected to this. It's, it's not. Uh, they were nice enough to send me an autograph photograph uh, saying, uh, Jose, greetings from Miami. This was the cast of CSI Miami. Uh, none of them are in Miami. They're all in Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> This is the real cast of CSI Miami. This is my research group at FIU, and I want to thank them for all their hard work, and uh, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>